Akiru Translated to Live is a 1952 film directed and co-written by Akira Kurosawa, the great Japanese filmmaker. The film examines the struggles of a terminally ill Tokyo bureaucrat, Mr. Watanabe, and his final quest for meaning. The screenplay was partly inspired by Leo Tolstoy's 1886 novel, The Death of Ivan Illich. Akiru was followed by Kurosawa's most acknowledged film, Seven Samurai. Ikiru was made during Japan's post-war reconstruction when the country was adapting to newly inherited capitalism and democracy. Kurosawa says, "Sometimes I think of my death. I think of ceasing to be." And it is from these thoughts that Ikiru came. Fumio Hayasaka, Kurosawa's close friend and also the music composer for many of his films, was suffering from tuberculosis at the time of Ikiru's production. So this could be a reason for the making of Ikiru. The first part of the film begins with the narrator showing an X-ray of Watanabe's stomach and the knowledge that he has stomach cancer. The first part further demonstrates Watanabe's progress from knowing that he has stomach cancer to the realization that he can find meaning to his life. The second part also starts with the narrator's voice informing the viewers about the demise of Mr. Watanabe. The remaining part presents the funeral and how he is being remembered. there is a difference in the structure of both the parts first part has a more freer narrative comprising of several flashbacks as reconstruction of events while the second part has a unity of time and space at the start of the second part there is probably one question among the viewers why didn't the movie end at watanabe's death we have followed watanabe on his last journey and are now brought forcibly back at the land of the living to cynicism and gossip Mentally we urge the survivors to think differently to arrive at our conclusions and that is how Kurosawa achieves his final effect he makes us not witnesses to Watanabe's decision but evangelists for it Watanabe is in complete shock and despair after receiving news of his cancer or his impending death upon, me- upon meeting the self proclaimed Mephistopheles The writer and Watanabe embark on a journey to experience the vices of Tokyo. Participating in the amusement of pachinko, alcohol and dance may prove to Watanabe that he is not alone. Many rely on immediate distractions and superficial solutions. However, as the writer declares, he is isolated and alone in the suffering. With teary eyes and choked voice, Watanabe sings Gondolo no Uta or Life is Brief. Dancers stop their movements to stare at the singing Watanabe. The girl on his lap shrinks away from him with a startled look on her face as he refers to the fading crimson bloom. The second stanza features a close-up of Watanabe with tears in his eyes, singing barely moving his lips. Watanabe is eventually carried away by the writer as he lets out a final life is brief verse. His audience has grown thoughtful and distanced from Watanabe as if he has an infectious disease. The scene serves not only to demonstrate the powerful distance between Watanabe and others in the film but also to call close to him including viewers to reflect on his message of life's briefness. The scene serves not only to demonstrate the powerful distance between Watanabe and others in the film but also to call close to him including viewers to reflect on his message of life's briefness. Viewers learn through Watanabe that 30 years of continuous work and significant time spent unmarried as a widower were for the sake of his son still despairing from his recent diagnosis Watanabe hears the laughter of Mitsuo and his wife Kazue upstairs this worsens his despair as it appears they laugh at him suddenly Watanabe hears the call of dad twice Music stops before Watanabe climbs the stairs to his beckoning son only to receive an order to lock the front door. Watanabe descends with head lowered. All hopes of reconnecting with Mitsuo have vanished. A series of flashbacks demonstrates how far father and son have grown apart. These flashbacks prove to be visual equivalents of Watanabe's freely associated thoughts. Watanabe explains to Toyo, the young worker who becomes quite important to him, "My son is somewhere far." far away just as my parents were when i was drowning in that pond in addition to freely offering sleeping pills to the needy mephistophelian writer purchasing stockings to replace those torn for toyo and taking her for food at her mansion of eating only sardines subtle acts of kindness appear throughout the second part of the film primarily in the form of flashbacks 
These acts of kindness and sympathy occur between Watanabe and those who have been touched by his after he experiences a form of enlightenment and commits through action to fulfill his creative purpose. Watanabe desperately seeks to overcome his sense of isolation through interactions with Toyo. His deep desire to mimic her aliveness results in the honest, naive question, how can I be like you? But Toyo's aliveness seems accidental, neither self-conscious nor self-chosen. She fails to understand Watanabe's needs and cannot provide him with the answers. Over the course of the film, Watanabe has not only been unable to find meaning and inspiration necessary for his transformation from living dead to being worthy of death, but also he has been met at each turn with a self-conscious loneliness. With all seemingly lost, Watanabe raises his eyes to catch some reflected light that appears to glow. Throughout this statement, Watanabe stares at the toy rabbit, Toyo's creation, in front of him. Finally, he grabs it, holding it close to heart, and quickly descends the staircase, repeating, There is something I can do, and quickly descends the staircase. At this point, it is clear Watanabe has something specific in mind, most likely the creation of the children's playground. In a wonderfully crafted moment, Kurosawa depicts Watanabe descending the stairs just as Happy Birthday is played loudly by trumpets. Many young children frame the staircase in honor of the birthday girl, who ascends just as Watanabe departs. Such spiritual realization is colored by the toy rabbit symbol of youth and creative achievement and Watanabe is grasping a particular creative purpose open through his office. His inner enlightenment cannot be detached from his instantaneous physical behavior of clutching the rabbit and descending the stairs as if called to immediate action. Furthermore, the remainder of the film demonstrates Watanabe's unfaltering commitment to accomplishing his creative goal. He behaves as if action alone is significant, that man is neither his motivations nor knowledge but his deeds. Ikiru support the view that a personal rebirth or enlightenment requires action to fulfill its potential. Watanabe's action to create a children's playground capture a youthful energy and passion touched upon by his interactions with Toyo. Quoting Kurosawa, There is nothing that says more about its creator than the work itself, claims Kurosawa in his autobiography. Watanabe strives to create a children's playground and is first to swing on its swings. These facts color Ikiru's portrayal of creation as entailing an aliveness sought by Watanabe throughout the film. Ikiru is a cinematic expression of modern existentialist thinking. Although I'm not very sure of whether Kurosawa was an existentialist or not, but Ikiru for sure reminded me of Sartre one of the pioneers of existential philosophy. John Paul Sartre believed that human beings live in constant anguish, not solely because life is miserable, but because we are condemned to be free. While the circumstances of our birth and upbringing are beyond our control, he reasons that once we become self-aware, and we all do eventually, we have to make choices, choices that define our very essence. Sartre's theory of existentialism states that existence precedes essence. That is, only by existing and acting a certain way do we give meaning to our lives. According to him, there is no fixed design for how a human being should be and no God to give us a purpose. Therefore, the deed for defining ourselves and humanity falls on our shoulders. This lack of predefined purpose along with an absurd existence that presents this lack of predefined purpose along with an absurd existence that presents to us infinite choices is what Sartre attributes to the anguish of freedom. With nothing to restrict us, we have the choice to take actions to become who we want to be and lead the life we want to live. According to Sartre, each choice we make defines us while at the same time revealing to us what we think a human being should be. And this incredible burden of responsibility that the free man has to bear is what relegates him to constant anguish. Man is condemned to be free because once thrown into the world, he is responsible for everything he does. Everything has been figured out except how to live.